So if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about what this so if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about what this Chime model is from your understanding and how it might compare to some other models that have been thrown about in the news recently. Sure, be happy to. The critical part with that is it allows um, hospitals to do projections at a local level. Most of the other projections that have been done that are out there, including some excellent projections by um, the Institute for Health Metric and Evaluations out at the University of Washington are done on countrywide levels and statewide levels. What CHIME allows a hospital to do is to drill down to its specific catchment area. So TMH can put in numbers of they cover an area that includes, and I don't know the number they put in, but we'll say 200,000 people in this area they can project what percent of those patients go to TMH as compared to other smaller rural hospitals or capital regional. Um, they can put in specific numbers of patients in this immediate area who've already been infected and some of that rate of infection in this area. They can put in local estimates of social distancing effectiveness. And if you've seen lately, um, you've seen where the, uh, the sheriff's office had to break up a number of large gatherings and say, those are things that make it more likely um, that this is going to spread. So it can put in all of those factors and give some projections of how bad it will get and how quickly it will get that bad for a very specific hospital. That's what makes it different than the other models. Okay, and compared to those other models, at least in this situation, it projects a more sobering outlook in terms of how fast we might be reaching the peak here and how our capacity may be exceeded sooner rather than later. Um, were you expecting that sort of analysis based on it being a hyper-local situation or were you surprised by that? I expected it to be bad. It was a bit worse than I expected, quite frankly. Um, we, we stepped in to do some of the social distancing and the stay at home, but I think we did it a bit later than we should have and without the um, degree of restrictions that we should have. Bottom line is I think we should have started sooner and we should have started more aggressively with, uh, with social distancing requirements. And for our viewers who, you know, we're promoting a lot of what the, uh, is it the IMHE model, is the University of Washington model? Right, IHME. IHME, yes. okay, I was close. Um, that model, which is, is, as you said, goes only as far as state level, as far as I could tell, um, you know, is projecting a state peak in late April, but for this model for Tallahassee, it would be June or late May. Is that just because you're talking about the law of averages here, that with South Florida involved with the statewide model, they're farther along the curve? Is that your understanding? That, that certainly is a lot of it. Obviously, South Florida is a much more densely populated area than up here in the Panhandle. Um, I think part of the lateness of our peak um, reflects uh, some of the early steps that were done in Leon County. Um, you know, FSU and FAMU closing early, sending all of the students home. Um, you know, requiring issues of 14-day self-quarantine if you've left the county. So all of those things were smart, and they, they were very appropriate. And all that they do, is, but what they do is they delay it. They can't prevent the process. So that gets back to that whole concept of flattening the curve. We know it's still going to peak, but if we can have it peak less high than it would have otherwise, and the later it peaks, the better because it gives us more time to find out what are effective treatments. Um, more time, I don't think we're gonna have a vaccine in two months, but at least it moves us closer to the potential of vaccines. It gives us more time to stock up with ventilators, to stock up with all the supplies that are needed. So while, while on the one hand saying, yes, this is, this is worse than many of us expected, it's still better than the alternative, which would have been a much higher peak long before we were even remotely ready for it. Okay, so there is a silver lining or a different way to look at it. Um, Absolutely. Uh, but there still is that capacity lag. There's a, the gap between beds available. And I know TMH is talking about, you know, getting approval for a field hospital if it's needed. And, you know, so based on what you've seen, what you would expect, do you think those steps will have to be taken here? Or is it just anyone's guess? 
I think that some of those steps will need to be taken, and, and it's one of those cases where you're far better to have planned out for it in advance to say where would the field hospital be, how many beds do we need, et cetera, et cetera, and then we can all have a big celebration when it's not needed or we, when we only need half as many beds as we projected. Um, but, but that's the difference. If, if we need twice as many as we plan for, then everybody is in trouble. If we only need half as many, then we say, well, great. It was, a, it was a good planning exercise. Thank goodness we don't need as many. Okay. For the mom who's trying to homeschool her kids right now, for the business owner who is looking at you know really dire numbers, to see that the local peak isn't until June, it could be taken as devastating. How should people be interpreting this information? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the biggest issue to keep in mind um, is to be able to say we're, we're not past this, to, be, to say to people, no, you can't expect that on April 30th, magically it's going to go away and we'll be able to go back to the way things were. Um, it's looking at this as many of us have said, it's a marathon and not a sprint. So this is a long standing one. So to the people who are frustrated being home for prolonged stay at home orders, to the mom who has to homeschool her kid for that much longer, um, it really is a matter of saying, what are my coping skills? What, what else can I do? How much can I draw on other resources? Um, whether that is uh, meditation or thoughtful reflection whether that is new and creative ways to let the kids spend more video FaceTime with their grandparents who live in another state, anything like that that says these are the little joys that we get along the way. Sure. Now, local officials and state officials have to maybe be making these decisions, but if it's, say, mid-May and we are not yet at our peak, but South Florida is well beyond their peak, how are we going to juggle these differences, and how do can we say, hey, in Tallahassee, you're going to have to stay at home for another two weeks, a month, while your friends in Miami are out and about? Where is that? How is that going to play out? That's going to be difficult. You're absolutely right. And, and it, it's one of the challenges that, are, that is dealt with when it comes to social distancing. And, and we've seen it. Many people have seen the, the picture of when one county closes its beaches and the adjoining county does not. You know, you've got a beach that's empty and then a line in the sand, literally a line in the sand, where now hundreds of people have gathered. And so what's going to be problematic is loosening restrictions in one county versus another. And if people from Leon County say, well, guess what? I'll go visit my friends down in South Florida where I, they don't have as many restrictions. That's a great way for South Florida to then see its second surge, to see a second peak because people come there um, from other places. And just for the hypothetical or the, to lay the groundwork, it would be sound medical advice to assume that as long as our local peak has not been yet reached or we're still just just beyond it, we still have to be practicing these social distancing measures. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. That, that, that is essential. And until we are clearly over that hump, um, it's not when we think we've hit the peak. It's when we've clearly made it across the top of that curve and we're seeing some downward trending that we can start to maybe relax some of the restrictions in a very careful and controlled area. But it's not like going to be flipping a switch and saying, okay, there you go, everybody back to normal, every business can reopen, you know, everybody can just pack the beaches again. It's going to have to be in a very controlled fashion. Okay. Any other argument that needs to be mentioned here or element to this discussion? Well, I, I think one of the other things to keep in mind that, that has many of us in the uh, healthcare care very concerned is the issues of the impact on health uh, professionals, whether that's outpatient uh, primary care docs like myself, whether that's in a hospital setting, is it's not just COVID, but the issue is the strain that COVID puts on the system puts everybody at risk. The person who's got a heart attack, because heart attacks still happen, the person who falls and breaks their leg because broken bones still happen. And people like that are going to have less and less access to a very strained healthcare system. So, so without trying to ensue too much worry or panic, it's mindful of, think of all of the things that we need a healthcare system to address from a heart attack to a stroke to, you know, strep throat or a broken bone. 
when the system becomes overwhelmed, it's overwhelmed for everything. Um, and so that's where, uh, you know, I've been very appreciative of seeing some of the commercials from the CDC of saying, if you want to be a hero in this fight, stay home. And staying home is not an act of retreat. It's an act of doing the smartest thing that you can do, saving the lives of yourself and others by not putting that added strain on the system. All right. Well said. Well, thank you, doctor, so much for the time. I really do appreciate it.